Hello everyone. Now the topic for discussion is etiology of malocclusion. What exactly malocclusion means? Any deviation from normal occlusion is nothing but malocclusion. Andrews gave six keys for a normal occlusion. That is first molar interarch relationship. That is the mesobuccal cusp of maxillary molar should occlude in the buccal group of the mandibular molar. Second, labiolingual crown angulation. That is the gingival portion of the long axis of the crown. Sorry, mesiodistal crown angulation. The gingival portion of the long axis of the crown must be distal to its occlusal part. Third, labiolingual crown inclination. That means all maxillary centrals have positive crown inclination. Mandibular, uh, mandib maxillary incisors have positive crown inclination. Mandibular incisors have negative crown inclination. Upper and lower posteriors have negative crown inclination. Fourth, absence of rotations. Fifth, um, that having tight contacts. There should be proper tight contacts between all the teeth. And the last key is nothing but the curve of speech should not be more than 1.5 mm. If all these six keys are maintained, that is molar interarch relationship, mesiodistal crown angulation, labiolingual crown inclination, absence of rotation, tight contacts, and correct curve of speech, then occlusion is considered to be the normal occlusion. Any deviation from this normal occlusion is nothing but mal occlusion. Today, in this chapter, we will be dealing about what are the etiology of malocclusion. It is nothing but what are the various causes or the causes of malocclusion. There are a number of classifications given for malocclusion, but the most commonly used is the Graeber's classification, who have classified malocclusion into two main categories. It can occur because of general factors or local factors. General factors include heredity, congenital, environment, predisposing metabolic and climatic diseases, dietary deficiencies, abnormal pressure habits, posture, trauma. And next we will deal even about local factors. First let us complete general factors. Heredity. We usually come across a number of families where there are a lot of similarities among members. It is quite logical that an offspring is nothing but a byproduct of two different genetic combinations. Father of one, uh, one particular genetic makeup, mother of one particular genetic makeup. Both the genes of both uh, father and mother combines and produces a byproduct that is nothing but an offspring. So it's quite logical that offspring usually have much similarities to their parents. This is because of the transfer of genes from parents to the child. Lundstrom said that uh, there are a number of human traits which are actually dependent upon these genes. These traits include first abnormalities or the similar similarities in the tooth size. Like the size of the teeth usually are identical in parents as well as in case of children. Tooth shape. Shape uh, also uh, is to a greater extent uh, quite similar between the parents and uh, children. Arch dimensions. Next is arch length, arch width. Everything will be similar. Uh, next coming to labial freedom, freedom attachments, apart from its inter-arch variations, that is variations in sagittal, transverse and vertical plane, crowding, spacing rotations. There are a number of tribes which usually have, their, have genetic influence. Next coming to congenital defects. Congenital defects actually means the defects with which a child is born. There are a number of congenital disease, congenital uh, factors. There can be general congenital factors, local congenital factors. Apart from this, congenital syphilis, maternal rubella diseases, cerebral palsy, clefts, etc. First, coming to general congenital factors. General congenital factors are all uh, considered through the condition of the mother, like abnormal pressure on the fetus during the, during the time of pregnancy. Improper nutrition to the mother during the time of pregnancy, excessive irradiation to the mother during the time of pregnancy, consumption of certain drugs, they are considered as teratogens, consumption of those drugs uh, by the mother during the time of pregnancy, all these comes under general congenital factors. Local congenital factors are all associated with fetus, that because of abnormal pressure of the fetus, uh, develop, abnormal development of the jaws, macroglossia, microglossia, various types of clefts, etc. Next is cleft of the lip and the palate. Cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a condition wherein there is lack of muscular coordination. Because of this lack of muscular coordination, there is uncontrolled and aberrant muscular movements because of which there is abnormal development. First, abnormal pressure on the jaws because of which the jaws abnormally develops. Congenital syphilis. Congenital syphilis is a bacterial infection which is caused by Treponema pallidum. Most commonly spread through sexual intercourse. Apart from this, mother is also one of the most common root. From mother, usually this um, uh, disease trans gets transmitted to children. The children are usually born with Hutchinson's incisors and mulberry molars, enamel hypoplasia. And these children uh, usually are characterized by frequent occurrence of the caries. 
Hutchinson's incisors are usually round, uh, blunted incisors and mulberry molars are the molars which usually have rounded cusps. One of the, these are very um, uh, indicative signs of congenital syphilis. Third is environment. How environment is actually run into two uh, categories, prenatal factors and postnatal factors. Prenatal factors are all the factors which are responsible for causing various types of malocclusion before birth and postnatal or after birth. So what could be prenatal? Prenatal are associated again with mother. Like one of the most common is because of abnormal pressure acting on the fetus. But malocclusion will usually occur because of this abnormal pressure, usually self-correcting. As time goes on, they usually get corrected by themselves. But because of presence of other conditions in the mother, like amniotic lesions or maternal fibroids, they usually cause very permanent damage as to the developing fetus. Next coming to postnatal factors. Postnatal factors are all associated with the child. First, forceps delivery. Because of application of abnormal pressure with the forceps at the TMJ, usually it may cause damage to the TMJ of the child and this may result in the development of malocclusion. Second is any trauma to the condyle because of any fall or anything. If the condyle gets breaks off or if there is any fracture of the TMJ, again this may result in the development of various types of malocclusion. Third is a condition like in case of uh, uh, certain type of traumatic injuries. Also, the child may develop, uh, the child may fall off and may get uh, and may undergo various type of trauma. This may also result in occurrence of various types of uh, 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 malocclusions. Apart from this, those children who suffer from burns or any scar tissues very early in their age, so that particular tissue doesn't grow to required amount of extent, and that area usually remains constricted. Uh, and Milwaukee braces, which are usually given in the scoliosis patients. All these things constitutes the postnatal factors. Prenatal factors are associated with mother because it is before birth. Postnatal factors are all associated with child because it occurs after the birth. Predisposing metabolic climate and diseases. It is very important. One of the most commonly metabolic is uh, acute febrile diseases, which are most commonly responsible for causing metabolic disturbances. And uh, what are various endocrine imbalances? Two glands plays a very important role. Thyroid gland and parathyroid gland. Thyroid gland secretes thyroid hormone. Parathyroid gland secretes parathormone. Deficiency of thyroid hormone, hypothyroidism. Excess, hyperthyroidism. Deficiency of parathormone, hypoparathyroidism. Excess, hyperparathyroidism. Now, hypothyroidism, that is deficiency of thyroid hormone, usually causes retardation in the rate of calcium deposition. As retardation in the rate of calcium deposition on bones and teeth takes place, the teeth usually uh, erupts very late. There is delayed eruption of teeth. If they erupt also, they are more prone for caries because there is lack of calcium deposition on the teeth. On the other hand, in case of hyperthyroidism, there is excess deposition of calcium in bone and teeth. In case of hypoparathyroidism, there is deficiency of parathormone. It usually affects the calcium metabolism. Whereas in case of hyperparathyroidism, Excess of calcium is available in the blood, circulating blood. That means there is lack of calcium availability for the deposition of the bones and the teeth. And hence again it affects the proper formation of the bones and the teeth. Next coming to dietary problems. Proper dietary supplement to the mother during the time of pregnancy and even after the birth of the child is very much important. If proper nutrition supplements are not there, it will result in occurrence of various types of bone diseases and, and there will be improper development of the teeth. <clears throat> various types of diseases include rickets, scurvy, uh, um, uh, marasmus, kwashiorkor. These are all dietary associated or dietary deficiency problems. Next coming to abnormal pressure habits. How abnormal pressure habits plays a very important role. Usually, the children in, during their development develop certain types of habits like thumb sucking habit, tongue thrusting habits. These thumb sucking habits have abnormal pressure um, when the child keeps his thumb frequently inside the oral cavity. It creates a lot of pressure on the uh, anterior aspect of the parent because of it, that the anterior teeth usually gets proclined. And as the teeth, as the child sucks, it creates a pressure inside, it, it, causes, sh it causes shrinkage of the cheek because of this the upper arch usually becomes narrow. Apart from this tongue thrust habit also, because of frequently thrusting of the tongue, the child develops anterior open mind. These are abnormal pressure habits. Next is posture. How posture plays an important role in the development of malocclusion. Many children usually have habit of resting their usually resting their chin on their hands, and few children even rest their chin against their chest. Because of a continuous acting of the pressure in this way, it also results in abnormal growth of the skeletal basis. Accident and trauma. 
games and all sports activity children cannot be stopped from uh, doing any sports activity and all and occurrence of small types of accidents and trauma is also quite logical but as soon as any accident or trauma occurs proper inspection of the teeth has to be done if there is any traumatized teeth or any adult teeth or any non vital teeth it has to be treated then and there possible so that further development of any sort of malocclusion can be avoided so this was all about general factors heredity congenital environment predisposing metabolic climatic diseases dietary deficiency abnormal pressure habits posture accident and trauma now let us know what are the various local factors local etiological factors of malocclusion first in this we'll deal about anomalies in number of teeth in this first supernumerary teeth any teeth more than normal are nothing but considered as supernumerary teeth supernumerary teeth in 75% of the cases are actually identified accidentally accidentally when an iopa when an opg is taken usually they remains unnoticed and most of them are usually impacted only but most commonly supernumerary teeth are seen in relation to the anterior that in between two central incisors one more teeth will be present it is called as mesiodens but occurrence of this supernumerary teeth in premolar area and molar area is also not uncommon uh, sometimes pre, uh, supernumerary teeth even occurs distal to the molar they are called as distal molars supernumerary teeth if they remain impacted they interfere with the orthodontic movement and if they erupt also they result in occurrence of crowding Next is missing teeth. It is totally opposite to supernumerary teeth. Sometimes the teeth will be congenitally missing only. Sometimes they will be very even totally missing, and sometimes uh, they remain impacted and doesn't erupt into the oral cavity. Missing teeth usually results in occurrence of spacing. Next is anomalies in tooth size. Sometimes the size of the tooth may be affected. In this, first is fusion. Fusion actually refers to complete union of two separate tooth. and this union takes place between the enamel dentin and everything of two separate unions together and results in the formation of one bigger tooth next is gemination gemination refers to partial development of two different teeth from a single tooth bud and concrescence concrescence is nothing but union of the root portion of two separate teeth apart from this microdontia and macrodontia microdontia is decrease in the size of a tooth macrodontia is increase in the size of the tooth next is anomalies of tooth shape sometimes the sometimes the shape of the tooth itself may be affected one of the most commonly seen condition here is peck shape laterals <coughs> peck shape lateral is a condition wherein the size of the lateral incisor will be very much small in the form of a peck and this is this usually occurs most commonly in relation to certain syndromes apart from this few patients usually have an abnormal very large cingulum on the parietal aspect of upper incisor whenever this large cingulum on the parietal aspect of upper incisor is present it prevents proper closure of upper and lower arches it usually doesn't help in establishment of proper overjet and overbite sometimes apart from this there will be an abnormal uh, additional cusp may be present in mandibular second premolars apart from this congenital syphilis it is a condition characterized by hutchinson's incisors and mulberry molars that is blunt incisors and rounded molar cusps apart from this a uh, one more condition like dilaceration there is a sharp bend will be present between the crown and the root portion of a tooth all these are abnormal shapes of the teeth next is abnormal labial frenum actually prior to the eruption of the teeth labial frenum is actually attached at the incisive papilla region with the help of the fibers the fibers from the labial side passes or crosses the alveolus and gets inserted on the parietal aspect as the teeth start erupting this uh, labial attachment this labial free attachments moves apically but sometimes it doesn't moves and a thick labial frenum exists between two central incisors this will prevent two central incisors from get uh, from coming close to each other and a midline diastema persists this abnormal labial frenum is usually identified by doing a blanch test so actually this labial frenum has to be corrected by doing phrenectomy procedure next is premature loss of deciduous teeth Sometimes there is premature loss of the deciduous tooth takes place. Now, whenever this uh, premature loss of deciduous tooth takes place, permanent teeth usually doesn't uh, uh, erupt at its correct position. This is quite common due to premature loss of deciduous second molar. Because of premature loss of deciduous second molar, permanent molar usually whenever it erupts, it migrates mesially. Hence, space maintainers have to be kept to maintain its position, and that includes another uh, separate treatment protocol. 
prolonged retention of deciduous teeth. Sometimes there is a prolonged retention of deciduous teeth. Deciduous teeth doesn't fall off at its uh, given time. This usually happens whenever there is a non-vital deciduous tooth or whenever there is a where, where, where there is absence of a permanent tooth bud and sometimes in case of ankylosed deciduous tooth. Delayed eruption of permanent teeth. This is also quite similar. Uh, why the uh, eruption of a permanent teeth could be delayed? It could be delayed because of ankylosed uh, pre presence of an ankylosed deciduous tooth or a non-vital deciduous tooth or because of presence of very thick mucosal barrier on the uh, above the permanent tooth or presence of any certain bony uh, because of presence of certain some amount of bone above the permanent tooth. So this bone have to be removed, mucosal barrier has to be removed then only the permanent tooth will erupt into the oral cavity. Next is abnormal eruptive part. Because of sometimes there could be presence of some uh, deciduous root fragment will be present or sometimes what happens uh, if, uh, if the deciduous root doesn't fall up, usually the permanent tooth will erupt but will erupt in an abnormal path either buccally or parietally deflected. Next is ankylosis. <clears throat> ankylosis is a condition wherein a part or the complete root usually gets directly fused with the top of the underlying bone. This usually occurs whenever there is a trauma to a tooth. Because of any trauma to a tooth, it causes perforation of the periodontal ligament membrane and ultimately fusion between the root and the bone takes place. It is quite often even seen in cleidocranial dysostosis and certain other syndromes also. Next is dental caries. Uh, dental caries is also very much responsible for causing malocclusion. How is whenever dental caries occur and it is not properly restored at a correct time, usually uh, severe decay of a tooth takes place. And whenever decay of a tooth takes place, the opposing tooth usually gets supra erupted. In case of proximal caries also, if proximal caries are, uh, is not corrected and the tooth is not contoured, then usually it causes mesial or the distal migration of the adjacent teeth. Next is restoration. Proper restoration should also be done. In case of improper restoration also will result in the occurrence of various types of malocclusion. Like in case of over contoured restorations, there will be uh, premature contacts will be there. And in case of under contoured restoration, supra eruption of the opposing teeth takes place. So this was all about various types of local uh, uh, factors causing malocclusion. So we have dealt about both general factors and the local factors causing etiology of malocclusion. Thank you.